everything will work out fine. Just have faith when you pray, when you need a friend, when you need a friend. Just have your prayer in despair I know you'll be right there just have faith when you pray when Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, Pastor, we can. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Sheris. And uh, thanks for that group. I mean, amazing. The God has gifted them. And I welcome you all to our service this morning, King's Cross and New Life. I've got a few friends that have joined. We have Donia, we have Deborah, we have one of our pastor's wife, Sister Gill. Thanks for joining us. And if there's any others that I didn't see, please feel welcomed. And I uh, hope today's service will be a blessing to you. Let us pray as we open God's word. Gracious Father, as we open your word, open our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, today, um, Sister Luann, when she reminded some time ago that uh, this week is Women's International Day. And so I thought I haven't preached a sermon on women. I don't think I have preached after I joined uh, New Life and King's Cross. So I thought it is highly right time that I preach on the woman. I think March 8th, this coming Sun Monday, is the Women's International Day, isn't it? Uh, the Women's, um, well, U UN Women's, uh, it says, the, the theme of this Women's Day is Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. That's the theme for the Women's International Day for this year. Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a, in a COVID-19 world. 
you know, the UN website says, women of the world want and deserve an equal future free from stigma, stereotypes, and violence. A future that's sustainable, peaceful, with equal rights and opportunities for all. To get us there, the world needs women at every table where decisions are being made. UN Women is working to provide support to all women on the front lines of the fight against this pandemic, promoting flexible working arrangements and prioritizing services to prevent gender-based domestic violence. That's what uh, is the main theme for this year's Women's uh, Day, uh, International Day with the theme, Women in Leadership. Celebrating the, you know, they say celebrating the tremendous effort by women and girls around the world in shaping a more equal future and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and highlights. Um, so women's full and effective participation and leadership in all of areas of life drives progress for everyone. I agree with that statement. If woman is happy, if they're progressing, the whole family will be happy. Yet women are still underrepresented in public life and decision making as revealed in the UN Secretary General recent report. It says, women are heads of state of our governments in 22 countries and only 24.9% of national parliamentarians are women. That is quarter, one quarter, I mean quarter of it. At the current rate of progress, gender equality among the heads of the government will take, can you guess how long according to UN report? Another 130 years. For the world to recognize and bring the women to the equalness of men, it would take another 130 years, I believe. Women are also at the forefront of the battle against COVID-19 as frontline and health sector workers, as scientists, as doctors, and as caregivers. Yet, they get paid 11% less globally than their male counterparts. An analysis of COVID-19 team tasks, teams from 87 countries found only 3.5% of them are gender parity. When women lead, we see positive results. Some of the most efficient and exemplary responses to the COVID-19 pandemic were led by women. And women, especially young women, are at the forefront of diverse and inclusive movements online and on the streets for social justice, climate change, and equality of, in all parts of the world. Yet, women under 30 are less than 1% of parliamentarians worldwide. Women under 30 are only less than 1%. This is why this year's International Women's Day is a rallying cry for generation equality, to act for an equal future for all. The Generation Equality Forum, the most important con convening for gender equality investment and actions, kick off in Mexico City from 29 to 31 March this year and culminates in Paris in June 2021. It will draw leaders, visionaries, activities from around the world safely on a virtual platform to push for transformative and lasting changes for generations to come. I've taken this from unwoman.org. Well, the reason I read this is to let them know the world is changing. So enough you just even, le even less than a hundred years ago, women had no rights, they can't even do participate in voting. They can't even go to a white collar job so much, but so many changes, man, uh, pe pe men are recognizing the importance women play in society. So hopefully all these things will continue to improve and the disparity will minimize. But I'm not here to preach about the politicalness or correctness or whatever. Our purpose as God's children is to find something that makes us feel that in the sight of God, all are equal. You know, now the world is trying to see women should be equal. But in the creation itself, you know what the Bible says? In the image of God, did he create male and female? God never had this day, uh, uh, unequalness between man and woman. In his sight, both are equal. He died for both. He created both of them in his image. And sometimes Christianity is be blamed that it is actually the religion that promoted this disparity 
where male dominance, you can see so many things. Of course, when you read the Bible on us at surface level, it looks like that male dominance throughout the Bible history. Jesus never even had one single female disciple in that 12. I don't want a God like that. I know people who don't want to believe in God because they think he's a male, male uh, biased God. But if you read Bible carefully, though it is true that positions were not given to men as we see to a um, woman, as we see to the men, but the prominence that God put on women is no lesser than men in the Bible. It only takes for you to see with a clear and open mind how God dealt with women, how God treated women, both in the Old and in the New Testament. To illustrate how God, how special women are to God, not just as women, even in leadership, even in the way God used them. I'm going to illustrate today with a story in the Bible. I'm sure you might have known this story, maybe some of you, and maybe for some of you, definitely, it may be a, a new story to you. I'm not sure, but uh, this, uh, this has been such an inspirational story to me in so many ways. So I will share that story with you today. Um, the title of my sermon is The Wise and Able Woman of Abel. The wise and able woman of Abel. Uh, this woman is from the Bible whose name is not mentioned at all. You could imagine, you know, there's a woman in the Bible, such a powerful, great woman, but her name is not mentioned. If her name was mentioned, I guarantee half of Christian women today would have had her name as their name. Such a powerful woman she was. You know, Mary is such a common name because she was the mother of Jesus and whatever. If this woman's name was mentioned, I will, I was, I'm sure many girls will have their names after this woman. If she was living today, she would have received the Nobel Peace Prize. She would have been one of the most powerful women that the world has ever seen. And yet, it's, you know, she's only mentioned in six or seven verses in the Bible, nothing more than that. And yet her story is so powerful and so rich in what we can learn as, uh, as God's children, especially as women of God. Turn with me to the book of uh, 2 Samuel. Turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel. I don't have PowerPoint today, but I'll be referring to the same chapters. I want all your Bibles to be open. I don't want you to imagine that I'm telling something that's not in the Bible. Keep your Bibles open to 2 Samuel chapter 20. 2 Samuel chapter 20. We may not, uh, so this is where we are going to study for a little while. But let me give you a little bit background to the story before I get into the story. Now, we all know that David was the king of Israel at this time. He had so many troubles, troubles during his kingship. Basically, from his own family, it was such a dysfunctional family that he had most of his troubles after he became a king were within his own family. One of the biggest problems he faced was from his own son, Absalom. Absalom wanted to dethrone his father and take over the throne. We know all the tricks he played. And finally, the, uh, David runs for his life. He leaves the kingdom and he runs because he was so scared where Absalom would kill him. So he runs and he, along with him, some of his loyalists go with him. One of them was Joab, his army commander. But he tells Joab, please do not kill my son, Absalom. If you find him, leave him in peace. Please do not kill him. And if you know the story of Joab, he was one of the most wicked army generals that you could ever have. He never listened to anyone. If there was one man that King David feared all his life, it was not Goliath. It was Joab. And you know who Joab was? He was uh, David's nephew. He was his half-sister's son. So his own flesh and blood in, in so many terms. So we know what happened. He never listened to King David. When he found uh, Absalom being hanged between heaven and earth on, on a tree, he just shot him and killed him. And there was another incident where Abner, who was in the northern kingdom, bit of a revolt against king, but then he king calls him and says, look, I, don't, I want us to put away our troubles. Let's live in peace. So he calls Abner to make peace. And King David made peace with him and he wants to send him away. But Joab comes to him and says, King, I want to have a word with uh, Abner too. I also want to make peace with him. I don't want any troubles. So David reluctantly says, okay, you can also talk to him. So he goes to Abner 
and you know what Joab does? He kills him. This man has no heart. He is that, that kind of a man. In fact, when King David heard that Abner was stabbed to death by Joab, he cries, he moans. He was so sorry because he called him to come for peace and his own army general had killed him. Such a cruel man he was. Now, so Absalom is dead. Uh, and now King David comes back to Jerusalem to take over the throne. When he was coming back to take over the throne, I want you to listen to this story because the background is important. When he was coming back to take over his throne, people accompanied him. They were so glad that he was still alive and he's still their king. They were so they were so glad that he was coming back to take over his throne. But another trouble started at this moment. This is where I want us to read. Second Samuel chapter 19. Keep, uh, it is chapter 19, verse 40 onwards. Chapter 19, verse 40 onwards. Look at this. When he was coming back from uh, his uh, flea to take back the throne after Absalom was killed, this is what happened. Verse 40 of chapter 19 of 2 Samuel. Now the king went to Gilgal, and Chimham went out with him, and all the people of Judah uh, escorted the king and also half the people of Israel. Just then the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king, his household, and all the David's men with him across the Jordan? So all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is a close relative of ours. Do you know what it means? When the king was coming back to take over his throne in Jerusalem, some people from Israel, the northern part of David's kingdom. They came and said, how is it that only you are allowing Judah, people of Judah to accompany you and to be there? Are we not your people? Don't we, Are we not your people that you, you have not called us to do? And look at how they respond, the men of Judah, 42. So all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel because the king is a close relative of ours. You know, if you think that we have tribalism today, nationalism today, racism today, or family, clan, and cliques today in the church. Imagine those days they have. When King David was brought back to take the throne, it was the people of Judah that were surrounding him. They did not allow the Israelites, the northern kingdom, or the northern part of his kingdom to be a part. And when they questioned, why is it? We are all his people. He is a king to us. Why don't you allow? What did the people say? He's not your man. He's our man. He's our blood. He's our tribe. He's not black. He's white. Or he's not white. He's black. Or he's a nation. He's ours. We come first. You see the trouble. So that's how they responded. So what happens then? Same verse. Why then are you angry over this? Have we ever eaten at the king's expense? Or have you given us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten shares in the king. Therefore, we also have more right to David than you. How did they say? Look, Judah people, you are only two tribes. But we are 10 tribes. How can you claim the king to be your, your man and not our man? We, have, we should have the majority or major part of him. But those people look at the same verses, 30, 43. Uh, why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to advise bringing back our king? Yet the words of the men of Judah were fierce than the words of the men of Israel. In other words, no matter how much they pleaded and cried to be a part of that one, the men of Judah said, no, he is our man. He is a tribe of Judah. He does, he's not your people. Go away. So the men of Judah prevailed against Israel. So I want you to picture this. When this happened, King David came back to the throne. The children of Israelites were humiliated, Israel, Israelites were humiliated by the Judeans. And the Israelite people were going back. Among them, there was one man by the name of Sheba. He says, look, guys, you think it is high time that we realize who we are and not go after this Judah or Judean people because they have done insult to us. The king, the first king of Israel was who? Saul, a Benjamite from the land of Israel. They killed our king. It was because of him. They humiliated us. Now they're trying to take over everything. I think it's high time that we have our own kingdom or rule our own people. So that's what uh, this war, rebellious man Sheba had in mind. So what did he do? Now we begin our story in chapter 20. Second Samuel chapter 20. And there happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bikri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet. So after consulting with his people, what did he do? He blew a trumpet and said what? We have no share in David. Nor do we have inheritance in the sons of Jesse. 
every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bikri. But the men of Judah from the Jordan, as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king. Do you see now what happened? Division took over. As soon as he blew the trumpets and said, we have nothing to do with the son of Jesse or the David or the king or Judah, every Israelite obeyed him. In fact, those who are with, in fact, if you read uh, um, chapter 19, verse 40, read chapter 19, how many people were with, is, uh, with David when he was coming back? Chapter 19, verse 40. Now the king of went to, um, to Gilgal and Chimham went on with him and all the people of Judah escorted the king and also how many? Half the people of Israel. So there were so many who still followed King David. Half of them, it says, doesn't mean the whole of half tribes, but main leaders. Now when, when, uh, now when Sheba gave the trumpet, everybody deserted him. They left the king's palace, his presence. They went and followed Sheba. Now king realized, you know what he says? This is more dangerous than my son Absalom. Now it is the kingdom is going to divide. Now we have to do something about this. So no, look what he says. Verse 3, chapter 20, verse 3. Now David came to his house at Jerusalem and the king took the 10 women, his concubine, we don't need to know that one for now. Verse 4, let's see. So what did he do after he came back to the kingdom? Verse 4, and the king said to Amasa, assemble the men of Judah for me within three days and be present here for yourself. So as soon as he came to the king, the first thing he did was he called one of his army general by the name of Amasa. You know who is Amasa? Amasa also is one of his army generals and he is also his nephew. He is the son of his sister called Abigail. So you see all his family was ruling in, in during all his time. So he calls him and says, look, Amasa, I want you to go and gather all the people. It, within three days, I want you to be here because if you don't control this man, look actually what he says, verse four, verse five. So, um, oh, okay. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. What did David tell Amasa? I'll give you, I'm giving you three days. Within three days, you have to gather everybody because we have to chase this man Sheba and catch him before he ruins our kingdom or brings division amongst us. Amasa went, it is almost three days now. He still didn't come back. He was delaying and King David was panicking. What did I do? I have already wasted three days. So what does he do? He turned to the alternative, verse six. And David said to Abishai, who is Abishai? Abishai also is his nephew, who is a brother to Joab. Now, I want you to know here, he hated Joab so much, King David, because he killed Abner, he killed his own son, Absalom. He, though he's an army general, King David was trying to avoid him. He calls his uh, nephew Amasa first, and when he delayed, he calls Joab's brother, Abishai, but he's not calling Joab because he's not happy with Joab's weird attitude and the way he does things. So he calls Abishai because Amasa was delaying. And what does he tell him? Verse 6. Now David said to Abishai, now Sheba, the son of Bikri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue them, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escapers. What did he tell Abishai? Abishai, I'm waiting for Amasa. He's not coming. It's already three days. I don't want to wait anymore. Take whomever you can from your Lord's servants and go pursue this man called Sheba. Catch him before he reaches any fortified cities. You know the history of the fortified cities? Any sinner, any murderer, anybody who did a crime, if they run into the fortified cities, then you cannot kill them. Because then you have to deal them justly. So before he hide, do it, you better catch him. So he calls Abishai and says, go catch him, take whomever you can. Because according to verse 6, he is more dangerous than my son Absalom. So what happens? Verse 7. So Joab's men with the Cherethites and the Palatites and all the mighty men went out after him. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bekri. You cannot keep Joab out of anything here. As long as he's alive, nobody can keep him out. David tried to avoid him, but he could not. Finally, it was Joab and some of these men who were actually chasing Sheba now, along with Abishai. Then what happens? Verse 8. When they were at the large stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them, and now Joab was dressed in battle armor. On it was a belt with a sword, fastened in its sheath at its hips. 
as he was going forward, it fell out. Look at me. I want you to picture this. What happened? As they were running, chasing for Sheba, they came across a person called Amasa. Who was Amasa? One of the army generals whom King David said, go bring people, gather all the people from the land of Judah. Three days passed. He delayed. So he now asked Abishai to do it. Now Amasa is coming. After delaying for three days, he is coming. Who saw him? Joab saw him. What was Joab doing when he saw? He was in a armor. He says he was dressed for battle. And when he saw Amasa, it says his sword, which was in his belt, it fell down. It fell down. Verse 8. So what happened? Verse 9. Then Joab said to Amasa, Are you in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand and kissed him. What did Joab do? Who is Joab and Amasa? Brothers, cousins. Because they both are nephews to David. So as soon as he saw Amasa, Joab said, Amasa, are you okay? How are you, my brother? Is everything okay with you? And he gave him a kiss. But the next verse is important. Verse 10. But Amasa did not notice that the sword was in Joab's hand. And he struck him with it in the stomach. And his entrails poured out on the ground. And he did not strike him again. Thus he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bikri. Have you seen the cruelty of Joab? What did Amasa do to him? Nothing. It was David who said, go and you lead the battle. Now Joab was upset. How dared King David tell others to do my job? So whomever, whoever he feels is against, whoever he feels is threatened, he just kills them. That's the kind of ruthless, cruel man he was. So his own cousin brother, he says, how are you, my brother Amasa? Are you okay? Is everything all fine with you? He catches him by his beard, gives him a kiss, and with the other hand, he stabs him in the stomach. The Bible says only once he stabbed and his intestines, everything burst out and he's died. And you know what? He leaves him on the main road, bleeding. He's dead. But some of his men, if you read the story, nobody wants to cross the road seeing an army general being killed so brutally. People stopped chasing Sheba because they're so worried. And one of his armies, Abishai says, his brother, no, whoever is for Job, go run after him. But people still stop to see what's happening. So finally, one of them actually uh, pulls the dead body out uh, to the other side of the road, throws him into the little valley there and covers it with a cloth so that nobody will see the terrible scene. And once he is taken out of the road, covered with a cloth, that's when everybody marched chasing after Sheba. Such a cruel man Joab was. Nobody he listens to. Nobody even dared to talk back to him. That's the kind, not, not even King David. Anyway, so going forward in the story, look at verse 12. But Amasa wallowed up in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the man saw that all the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him. When he saw that everyone came upon him, halted. When he was removed from the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bikri. And he went throughout all the tribes of Israel to Abel and Beth Maka and all the Berites. So they were gathered together and also uh, went after Sheba. So they, Joab with his army and Abishai were going to every city in Israel looking out for Sheba. And you know, finally, they came to know that he's in a city called, verse 15, called Beth Maka, Abel of Beth Maka. Look at verse 15. So then they came and besieged him in where? Abel of Beth Mecca. And they cast up a siege mount against the city. And it stood by the rampart. And all the people were with Joab, battered the wall to throw it. What happened? They came to know, listen to me, they came to know that Sheba is hiding in a city called Abel Beth Mecca. So as soon as Joab heard this, he, he surrounded the city, he besieged the city, he put a rampant, in other words, he's trying to now climb over the walls, and while he's trying to do it, the people are battering the walls. In other words, they're trying to destroy the walls, break down the walls so that they could go in, destroy whatever they could, catch hold of this man called Sheba, who has trying to dethrone King David and maybe kill him. He, he, that's what he wanted to do. Now here comes the hero of our story or heroine of our story. When this was happening in the city, people were scared. They were talking inside. 
Joab is outside. He is throw. He is he is battering the walls. He is going to overthrow the walls. I think today is our last day. Once he breaks the walls and comes in, we are done. He will leave nobody alive. There was fear. There was uh, scare mongering. There was all kinds of panic because they knew what a wicked and ruthless man Joab was and is, and what he could do to destroy anybody who comes on his way. So when this news was going on, there was a woman in the city. There was a woman in the city whose name the Bible does not mention. She hears this commo uh, commotion because she was a part of the city. She says, what's going on? Why are you all so scared? What's happening? She says, don't you know? There's a man called Joab outside. He's the army commander of King David. I believe they're looking for somebody. We don't know who it was, but now he surrounded our city. He's trying to break over the city. If he comes in, he kills everyone. We really don't know who he's looking for, but he is after our city. Looks like today is our last day of survival. I reveal, and this is the news that she got. You know what she did? This is a woman without a name. Look at what she did. Verse 16. As soon as she heard this, this is what she did. Then a wise woman, the Bible calls her as what? Wise woman, cried out from the city, Here, here, please, say to Joab, come nearby that I may speak with you. From the city, when she's hearing all the noises of chaos and commotion, when she could hear that people are trying to break over the walls and come inside, she cries out from the city, Oh, people who are outside, hey guys, men, whoever you are, listen to me. Listen to me. What does she say? Say to Joab, I want to speak to Joab. Whoever Joab is, I know who he is. I want to speak to Joab. Tell him, please, I want to speak to him. Look at her. Look at her uh, courage. And then what happens? Verse 17. When he had come near, so Joab heard her voice. So he came near to the wall so that she could hear and he could hear. What does he say? So when he had come near to her, the woman said, are you Joab? He answered, I am. For the first time in his life, I think, Joab actually stand, stood still to talk to somebody. He never dared do it, even that to a woman. It's amazing because this woman challenged him. And he says, are you Joab? He says, I am. Then she said to him, hear the words of your maid servant. And he answered, I'm listening. Okay, I'm listening. Talk to me now. Verse 18. So she spoke saying, they used to talk in former times saying, they shall surely seek guidance at Abel. And so they would be end dispute. In other words, have you not heard of our city? What kind of a reputation we have? Anybody who needs a word wise of wisdom, they come to us. We are known to be people of wisdom. We sort out problems not the way you look at it. Have you not heard of who we are? How dare you come and try to destroy our city, break down our walls? Don't you know for what we are known for? We are a people of wisdom. Your method of solving problems is not the only method. There is something else we can do. Look at this woman. When the whole city was silent, she stuck her neck out to talk to this ruthless, crude man. And what does she say? How dare you try to? Verse 9. She said, verse 18, sorry. She spoke saying, they used to talk in former times saying they shall surely seek guidance at Abel. And so they would end disputes. I am among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. What does she say? I am a woman who loves peace and I'm a woman who is faithful. So what? You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. When it says mother in Israel, she's not only, maybe she is one of the leaders in the church or ladies in the city, we don't know. Bible is silent, but she's mother in Israel. This city is one of the prominent cities. How dare you come to destroy this city? How do we know it's a prominent city? Because we know it has walls surrounding it. Any city in those days which is surrounded by walls, protected by walls, is known to be an important city. So by that, we know that it is one of the important cities. So she says, verse 19, you seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. How? Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? How come you, do, you plan to do such a wicked thing? Look at how Job responds, Joab. Verse 20, and Joab answered and said, far be it. Far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. He said, oh, my lady, it's not my intention to destroy you all. False. Had he broken all the walls, he would have destroyed everybody. That's the kind of man he was. But he has an agenda anyway. So he's saying, this is not so, but a man from the mountains of Ephraim, 
Sheba, the son of Bikri by name, has raised his hand against the king, against David. Deliver him only and I will depart from the city. What did he say? Woman, it's not my intention to destroy you all. I have no choice. Because he's hiding in your city, I have to get him. So in order to get him, I have to destroy everything. So he says, if only you give that man to me by the name of Sheba, because he revolted against king, I will go back. Now look at this woman. Look at the way she responds. The same verse, verse 21, second part. So the woman said to Joab, watch, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. You know what that means? Okay, that's the reason you are in this place now, to dis trying to destroy us. Look at her response. Watch, don't you dare come into my city. You just stand where you are. You just stand there and keep looking on to the top of the wall because in no time you will see the head of that man thrown over to you. Wow. She doesn't even know if Sheba was inside or not, but she gives a word. If this man is inside, we will deal with him, but you dare not come into the city. Stand there. If that's what you're looking for, we will give that to you. And she promises him instantly, his head will be thrown over the wall to you. Stay there. Dare not come inside. Then you know what she did? After speaking and talking to him, she turns back to go to the people in the city. Look at what she does. Verse 22. Then the woman in her wisdom, verse 22, then the woman in her wisdom went to all the people and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bikri, and threw it out to Joab. Then he blew a trumpet and they withdrew from the city, every man to his tent. So Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. What did she do? She went back to the city. She talked to the people there. They all listened to her. The next thing that happened was there was the head of Sheba flowing over the wall of the city to the foot of, to the foot of Joab. When Joab saw the head of Sheba, he knew that his work is done. Instead of killing the city, instead of destroying the city, breaking down the walls, Joab now blows the trumpet. The war is won. The battle is won. Let's go back to Jerusalem. Few verses. Verses 16 to verses 22. How many verses? Maybe seven verses or six verses. That's all this woman. No name. But she saved the city from one of the most wicked ruler, wicked army generals that the Israelites have ever had in their lifetime. How was she able to do it? Why did she do it? What do we learn from her? My dear church, I want us to learn a few lessons. We are talking about women in leadership. We are talking about the importance of women. Look at the story here. Those who think that women, women have no importance in the Bible, this is one of the examples, not only the example. Now, if the authors of the first and second Samuel were biased against women, if, you know, if I was a man who is biased and I know this story, you know how I would have written this? The men of the city of Abel, Bakmath, what did they do? They cut off the head of Sheba and threw it over. That's it. There would be no mention of woman. This is the beauty of God's word. God's word is so clear that it never tried to hide the truth, neither its false nor its success. Anyway, so what does this wise woman of Abel teach us? I want us to learn five lessons from this woman. Five lessons from this woman. She was a woman without a name mentioned in the scriptures, but she was a prominent woman. She was a woman without a name, but a prominent woman. So we need to learn some lesson. First lesson is what? Verse 16. Verse 16, chapter 20, verse 16. What does it say? Then a wise woman. What is the first thing that you learn about this woman? She is called a wise woman. Woman, you know, the book of the one book in the Bible that speaks so much of wisdom is the book of Proverbs. It speaks so much. Every time it refers to wisdom, it is in feminine gender. You could imagine how the, the wise man compares wisdom. You must cherish her. You must acquire her. He says, this woman is what? Wise woman. She did not, you know. When she heard this news that there is there's Joab outside, she did not fear Joab. Listen to this. Look at her wisdom. She did not fear Joab because she knew he was a ruthless man. He was a wicked man. She did not fear him. But who did she fear? She feared God. 
who is called a wise man or a wise woman according to bible because the bible says the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom i want you to not never equate wisdom with intellect or knowledge wisdom is not intelligence wisdom is not knowledge wisdom is beyond intelligence wisdom is beyond knowledge people are so smart i know of people who have done phd but there is nothing in their head actually my mother would take phd she would actually say the full form of phd she says permanent head damage there are people who are highly skilled highly qualified but they have no common sense wisdom is different from knowledge you don't get wisdom by reading plenty books you don't get wisdom by doing degrees after degrees there is two ways that you get wisdom one is by reading the word of god because that is god's way of teaching us what is right and wrong number 2 james says what if any one of you lack wisdom let him ask of god who gives freely only these two ways you get wisdom if you want knowledge if you want intellect yeah books can give you some kind of it why because wisdom is beyond knowledge and intelligence there are intelligent people that have no common sense some of us we know what is right but we never do why because we have intelligence we don't have wisdom just take example doctors who can tell you what is wrong with drinking and smoking they can give you lecture after lecture show you every problem that would come with it but during the breaks they go and smoke and they drink again what do you call them are they wise or are they smart so wisdom is beyond intellect and knowledge bible says she was a wise woman and she feared god that's why because proverbs 17 says the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom women today who are listening to me i'm speaking directly to you i want you to be a woman of wisdom not just knowledge and intellect don't compete with men only at the level of wisdom and intellect you are called to be wise more than intellect and more than having knowledge she feared god that's why she was called the woman of wisdom so woman of abel knew the law of god thoroughly you know this here is a man joab who is trying to kill how do we know that she knew the word of the lord because that's where you get your wisdom from you know when he came to she she knew the torah very well she know the laws of the land she knows the laws of the war even in other words she was actually when she was talking to joab she was saying hey man how dare you come and try to destroy our city don't you know the laws of war don't you know how to fight the battle don't you know the laws that the lord has put in place have you followed the laws before you even came to attack the lord do you think why do you think she i mean the bible doesn't mention she said this but this is implicated why because there is a law that they have to follow when they go to fight the battle turn with me to deuteronomy chapter 20 this is what the lord told the children of israel to do deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 10 deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 10 where it says when you go near a city to fight against it then proclaim an offer of peace to it and if it shall be that if they accept your offer of peace and open to you then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you and serve you but if the city will not make peace with you but makes war against you then you can besiege it you know what's the rule of the law what the lord told children of israel to do when you go to take over a city before you besiege it what do you do offer a peace offer a peace then if they accept your peace capture the men and women make them your slaves but if they reject the peace then you besiege it then you destroy it what did what did joab joab do he did the opposite he even before he talked to the city he even he before consulted anyone he besieged it first and the second thing he did he was trying to break down the walls so that he could completely destroy it that's the kind of man he is he doesn't listen to anyone what he feels is right that's what he does so here comes a wise woman who says joab you're not following the laws of the war or the battle how dare you do it don't you know the law that you have to first speak and offer peace and if we reject that then you do what you have to do she is a wise woman how where did she get her wisdom from from god because she know the law and she could quote it out so joab was never answerable to anyone in all his life you will not find an incident except to this woman when a wise woman speaks the world stands still 
when a foolish man or a woman speaks the world laughs at us this woman is a wise woman the first lesson i want you to learn is what she is a wise woman because of her wisdom she effectively takes ownership of the traumatic tender box of the situation she takes it into her whole hands she was not only wise woman but her wisdom was not just idle or inactive her wisdom was active in other words she put her wisdom into good use we have so many wise women who claim to be so wise but they're so inactive today they think they're so wiser in their own eyes but they're good for nothing i'm referring to women because it's a women's day don't think that it doesn't apply to men so this woman was not just wise how was her wisdom she was her wisdom was active she she was called to do something she did what she needed to do when she knew that she has to do something she did not just speak she was not a chatterbox she acted on her wisdom there's no point of having wisdom if you don't make it active she acted when she knew that there's something she has to do she acted upon it you know what god honors those who use their wisdom for his glory and this woman a wise woman put her wisdom into action and as a result she saved the lives of the innocent people in the city one of the sins of the church today on christians today is what we all think that we are so smart we know so much but we don't we all keep it brushed under the carpet it is just there lying we don't use it because we don't take we don't like we don't like taking risks or getting into trouble we, we play safe we play very safe that's how we do it but this woman put her wisdom into action not only was she wise not only was her wisdom active but her wisdom was spontaneous she did not even have time to go and consult the elders of the city she did not even have time to kneel down and pray lord what shall i do she was full of wisdom she made an instant decision she knew exactly what to do how do we know as soon as joab said you know what i'm not here actually to kill you all but my my main reason is there's a man she by new york city hiding i just want him how long did you think it took for her to respond to him if i was there if you were there what would he say oh is that so give us a half an hour or hold on for one hour i will consult with the city i will come back to you and tell you what we will do she never did that instantly she promised him don't dare even touch my walls stand there and watch from above you will see the head of sheba coming to you instantly she knew exactly what to do that's the kind of wisdom that this woman possessed not only was her wisdom she was wise, wise woman it was active wisdom it was instant anius you know roosevelt one of the, uh, the presidents of united states once he said nine tenths of wisdom listen to this nine tenths of wisdom consists in being wise in time did you get that nine tenths of wisdom consists in what being wise in time nine tenths of wisdom consists in being what wise in time in other words using wisdom at the right time in time no point of having wisdom when you don't use it when it is most needed if otherwise it's not a wisdom this woman's wisdom at that nick of the moment she knew exactly what to do she even promised that his head will be thrown even without discussing with other leaders of the church or other leaders of the city because she knew that if she delays there is a stake had she asked for 5 minutes and gone back by 5 minutes he would have destroyed the walls of the city he would have jumped into the city and who knows how many people he would have, he would have killed so and she knew that she has to use her wisdom instantaneously i was thinking when i was reading this what i would have what would i have done i would have said well let me call the board meeting at kings cross and new life i can't take a decision on my own i know what to do but i have no power i may be the pastor but i have to consult my church i would have gone on the diplomatic route committee after committee sitting committee standing committee and then by the time i would have come who knows the city would have been destroyed this woman said nothing doing i know exactly what to do she gives him a word and she does it and then she goes to the city and says look guys i gave him my word the only solution is we have to do this otherwise we will all be killed you know what kind of a cruel man he is they all agreed to her in fact she didn't kill the bible says they all killed him 
cut off his throat and throw him out she she was able to convince the man outside a wicked man she was able to convince people inside because she was a woman of wisdom she was a woman of wisdom dear woman what we need today is women of wisdom in our families we need women of wisdom in our churches we need women of wisdom in our communities in our societies ask yourself are you a woman of wisdom can people look at you and say she is a wise woman i can go to her her advice is so good her advice is so much needed in my life are you that kind of a woman are you that kind of a woman who make unwise decisions jump on every little thing that's happening and mess up things ask yourself today's story this great woman of abel teaches us the first lesson is what you need to be a woman of wisdom second one in order to be sorry before i go there if you want to build your family if you want to build your church if you want to build your children be a woman of wisdom you are called to build up things not to destroy things because a woman of wisdom builds up things builds up families builds up relationships number 2 what is the it says uh, uh, number 2 is she was a courageous woman how do we know was she courageous you know when the problem arised how many people stuck out their neck only she do you think she is the only woman living in that way, uh, whole city no actually the city is 103 kilometers north of jerusalem it was another one of the prominent cities those days i exactly do not know how many people are living they were men they were leaders they were women they were children they were elderly they were leaders they were judges and yet nobody stuck out their neck it was just this woman who stuck her neck out because she realized the danger she risked her life that's why we call her she is a woman of courage she she did not say uh, guys at least if you don't talk at least stand by my side let's go and represent give a let joab know that we are not alone that we are a good number no she stood alone she stood alone she was not only a great woman of wisdom she was a woman of great courage she went alone to challenge whom Joab, no person dare challenge Joab in his lifetime, but this woman challenged him. She challenged. She is actually more courageous than Joab. You know why? Joab is outside the city with an army surrounded. She is all alone inside, single-handed, because nobody in the city dared to accept to come and support her. She was alone, so she stood alone. She confronted the army commander of the whole kingdom. Look at her courage. look at her courage her courage supersedes the the men of the city even the men who always think that they are braver than women they were timid in the city nobody dared to talk but this woman spoke up she was more powerful than sheba who was hiding in the city he is the one who had the support of everybody by the way the city of abel bethmek is in israel he could have convinced them saying look it is king Jew, king david and his men who are trying to reject us as israelites i am trying to find and save us how you keep people can turn up no she was even more powerful than sheba because she convinced the city to be listen to her wisdom than to the words of sheba that's the kind of courage she had but courage is not only man many think courage is manly thing many think courage is a manly thing but you know what courage is a godly thing it's not a manly thing it's a godly thing all of us if we believe in god and have wisdom from god you can stand it today homes are being broken churches are being shattered we become captives of our own actions because we don't have the courage the most timid generation that ever lived is today we are so scared of everything we want to play safe the world portrays that you have to take death insurance you have to take health insurance you have to take in every every move we make we live in fear we play so safe but this woman is teaching women you need to be women of courage stand up stick near and stick your neck out for what you believe is true and right that's what this woman is teaching the third lesson from this woman is what it is also recorded in the bible um is it second samuel chapter 20 verse 19 Second Samuel chapter twenty verse nineteen. What's the third lesson? She says, "I am among the what? Peaceable." In other words, she says, "I am a woman who loves peace." So, what's the last third lesson you learn from her? She was a lo- peace-loving woman. 
Now, I want you to see, look at how many men try to bring peace to the situation. Here is King David wanted peace. And his solution was what? Go kill Sheba. Here is Shia. Here is Joab who wants peace. How did he try to confront it? Most, con most traditional way, kill Sheba. Here is Sheba who wants peace. He wanted to do, he wanted to overthrow David and take over so that there will be peace in his people among Israel. Everybody were using the means of war and killing in order to have peace. What did this woman do? She had an unconventional method to bring peace. She had a what? But the woman looked for another self. While everybody are looking as bloodshed to be the reason or to get the solution to be peaceful, this woman, because she was wise, she was courageous, and she loved peace more than war. She looked for a solution different. I know this is what I wanted to know. If you're looking for solution through war, you will not be able to find. You know, today we, we speak of peace. What are the weapons that every nation have to bring peace? It's weapons of war. That's the thing. That's what we try to acquire peace. Everybody wants to save their country and have peace by fighting. But this woman, because she was wise, she's teaching us, you get peace not by fighting, but by solving problems in a different way. That's what she teaches. What does she say? Deuteronomy 2010, she says, we need to talk. You don't have to fight to get what you want. You can talk in peace. You can argue, but you can come to a conclusion just by talking. You don't have to fight. That's what she told Sheba. I'm sorry, Joab, don't you remember the loss of the battle? You have to first offer a peace. If we reject, then you fight. But I'm here for peace. She says, I am a woman of peace. I love peace. And she offered a peaceful treaty to him. And as a result, you know what? Instead of the whole nation being destroyed and killed, it was the enemy, the rebellious Sheba, who was killed. And by what? The peace came. She spoke to the city of the danger and the solution. They agreed for her peace process. And then they did what they have to do. My question to you is, what kind of woman are you? Are you a peace-loving woman? Or are you a woman who is always quarrelsome? How do you solve your problems? Is it by quarreling, arguing, bullying, threatening? How, how, how do you sort your problems? And the problems you have in your family, in your, in your workplace, in your church, how do you approach? This lesson, this woman is teaching, the third lesson. You need to be a woman of peace. When you are a woman of peace, you, 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 you don't find traditional methods to sort your problems. God's wisdom, God's courage will give you a different solution like this woman had to sort out your problems. I pray that you will be a woman of peace. The fourth one, in the same verse she mentions, chapter 20, verse 19. What does she say? Chapter 20, verse 19. I am among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. What's the fourth quality of this woman? She was a faithful woman. The first one, she was a woman of wisdom. The second one, she was a woman of courage. Third one, she was a woman who loved peace. The fourth one, she was a woman of faith. In today's church conditions, I admire women for their faith in God. Very high, very, very few men around in the church. Our churches are full of women because of their faith that the churches are thriving. We don't deny that. But I want you to question yourself. Are you a woman of faith? She would have been one of the civil leaders in the, in the city. I do not know. Bible doesn't mention. But she was a woman of faith. When she spoke, people believed because she was a woman of faith. And she not only had a dead faith, her faith was backed up by her works. Faith without works is dead, the Bible says. If you say you have faith, it is no good faith. She showed her faith in God and in her people in the way that she acted to save them. Are you that woman who exercises your faith to save your people, to save your family, to save your children, to save your church? Or are you the woman of faith who wants to just save your skin? No, it doesn't matter who destroys who happens. She teaches us you need to get stick, uh, stuck your neck out and show your faith when you have to. Uh, when it matters most. Finally, it's not in the Bible, but this is what I get from her. She was a woman of selflessness. She was a woman of selflessness. How do I know that? When there was a danger, she didn't go into hiding. 
she said ah, it's not my problem i'm only a woman there are leaders in the city let them look at sort it out i will find a hiding and no she stuck out she risked her life to save a city and she risked her life she knew it would be danger if joab did not listen to her she would be he would be the she would be the first one to be killed because that's the kind of man he whoever talks back to him he would kill amasa never even spoke back just because david made him an army general to go and on this expend uh, the, on this rule on this uh, uh, work he was upset and he killed him that's the kind of man he is but this woman stuck her neck out because she was selfless for her to save the city is more important than to save her skin that's what she teaches me that's what she tells me how about you are you a selfish woman or a selfless woman do you think about your own needs your own desires your own comfort beyond your family your children your church your community your society your work if there is one thing i want you to learn today is you need to be a selfless woman that you can stick your neck out to bring peace to love others and so that you can live someone said you begin to live only when you live for others get this you begin to live only when you live for others if you are a woman who is living for self you have wasted your life because no no we are not created to occupy space eat up its resources and die some day we are created to make a difference in somebody's life and only a selfless woman can go that far so in conclusion i want you to know that god used women women are so important for god bible is full of examples of women who have been who have done great things for god this woman is one of the examples we have women disciples in the new testament they may not be among the 12 but there's so many maybe next time i'm preaching i'm going to preach one of the, about one of the women amazing women disciple but there were women women disciples there were prophetesses in the bible both in the old and then in the new testament special special distinction was given to women in the new testament the last to be at the cross was a woman were the two women marys the first at the tomb was mary magdalene the first person whom jesus jesus showed himself up after resurrection it was a woman to the first woman that he said he was the messiah was not even his 12 disciples it was a woman at the well in the first prayer meeting that happened there were women and men together god did not reject them not only the men but women were also there the first to greet the first missionaries in europe listen to this the first to greet the first missionaries in europe was a group of women by the river who were praying together when paul and other people went and the first convert in europe was lydia a woman to the gospel who served the lord who opened her heart and her home for god's work when god has and when we think of our own church adventist church when god wanted to establish a last remnant church give messages that appeal and open our eyes to see what god wants us to do as the last church god chose a woman in the name of ellen white to lead this church to guide this church to reveal his will in a much more clearer way it was the woman that god chose we can never say that god is unfair to women god has used women in the past god is using women now we thank god for our churches where women are so active and because of you all many things happen in the church but the question is god has a special place for women at home and at church and in society do you have that special place for god if the women if this woman of abel whose name is not mentioned if she was living today i'm sure she would have got nobel peace prize because she saved the lives of the whole city if her name was known today half of the women in christianity would have named their children after her because everybody would like to be like her why what what is so special about this woman let me conclude it is my prayer that you will be known as like this woman of abel woman of wisdom woman of courage women of peace women of faith and finally women of selfless love god bless you all amen apologies there i'm not too sure what's happening with my video thank you very much pastor for your wise words this morning
Thank you to all of you for joining us too. I can see you there, Sister Loza and Sister Falv. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. Thank you. Pastor, would you like to close us in prayer? We have a song for my girls, then I'll close. No problem. seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make Let us pray. Gracious Father, 
Thank you for speaking to us today as the world celebrates women. I want to thank you for women in our life. They're actually creators, Lord. It is because of them, we men, who we are today. Help us as men that we treat them with love and respect and give them the place that is due to them in our society, in our families, in our own lives. Lord, I thank you for the story of the woman of Abel. Even though her name is not mentioned, even though she is not one of the great people, uh, characters that Bible always talk about, very insignificant yet so powerful. To me, she is one of the most powerful women in the Bible times. She stuck her neck out to save the whole city. We have learned five qualities from her today, a woman of wisdom, woman of courage, woman of peace, woman of faith, and woman of selflessness. It is my prayer that every woman who heard me today will be a woman of wisdom, woman of courage, woman of peace, woman of faith, and woman of selflessness so that they will be happy, their families will be happy, their communities will be happy, everyone will be blessed. I pray, Lord, that our women will be richly blessed and they'll continue to make impact in our lives and in the lives of those that they live together and minister. Bless each one of them. Any struggles they have in their life, please take it away. Lord. Give them the strength to face the challenges and stand up for what they believe. Give them the wisdom to handle themselves and everyone around them in such a way that they are there to bring peace and joy and happiness and not destruction. Pray, Lord, that your blessings will be with us as we close our service today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. And thank you very much, Christina and Rosanna, for that very, very beautiful song. I am so glad that you reminded me they were singing, Pastor, because we would have missed out on such a blessing. 